Uh, and the most important is not to not to lose the dream. Actually, that's what I think. It's like you just you just sort of navigate in a way that you still are having this wonderful childish um, will to be a princess or prince. Uh, making bigger things is all that also means that you don't take more work to people. So uh, and. And especially on a certain level, you give work that also gives a feeling, feeling of, of dignity. If there is a prestige, um, it's actually more about that. That's what is actually now for me uh, super motivating. Uh, it's just to give this feeling of, of, uh, of dignity as a musician. I find fascinating how you can improve level of some ensembles not only on the musical level uh, on, on the musical uh, level but also also in how to make them being visible for the media and the audience and being uh, relatively more famous you know it takes time to be really famous welcome to the theater art life podcast today we're talking with martina postuska Twelve years ago, Martina founded and has since artistically led the O oh Orchestra, specializing in a repertoire from Baroque to late Romanticism. In addition to purely instrumental music, Martina has a particular interest in Baroque and classical opera. As a concertmaster and conductor violinist, she collaborates with top European ensembles operating within the historically informed performance practice movement. She leads a class on historical violins at the Academy of Music in Katowice, Poland, and is invited as a lecturer for summer courses in early music. Privately, she is the mother of Felix and Gusta, living in the countryside with her husband, Adam. Martina, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. Wonderful. So before we get a little bit of uh, insight into your career, tell us about your path into music originally. Well, I come from a musical family. Uh, that was, um, I guess... Uh, things are different. Um, they were they were different in the 80s. Um, when I started the school, um, being being actually raised in pretty industrial area, one of those you know full of coal mines, uh, um, whatever factories. Um, choosing a musical school or ballet school, uh, which were basically um, belonging to the state, uh, financially speaking, was one of the most uh, easiest way. Uh, yeah, the easiest way to actually be sure about the quality of education. So my parents put me into this music school together with my sister. We both play violin and my sister became a singer and I became a violinist. I was not really convinced that, that should be my way, but uh, it's it's a wonderful thing to start. You know, you got so many friends playing instruments. You do have actually hobby that is a little bit tiring because they actually force you to do it. And, and they... Uh, it's a little bit also this kind of post-Soviet school, you know, like Chinese gymnastic, uh, French uh, French ballet, Russian ballet, playing music. It's one of the things that you need to, at a certain moment, make kids to do it, force them somehow. But we come into the age of 20, 25, and we are actually pretty happy with the choice we've made. Uh, and that's how it all started. My father is... Uh, musician my sister started to be a singer and uh, and i played violin uh, out of both of us i'm the one who actually enjoys people much more uh, i mean like mm. having them around being around being surrounded uh, listening to the stories and actually making some stories and some ideas be, uh, come true uh, and then yes so that was that is the way i i actually anchored in in music, basically. Was there a, um, was it just violin or did you have other instruments to choose from or that was the one that you had to learn? Well, you know, that's what I mean. We do, actually, it's not like in other countries where people start to have hobbies and they jump from trombone to saxophone, uh, eventually ending up on oboe or, or the other round, rather. Um, we do actually, from the age of seven, we actually treat very seriously uh, this job almost like a, like a metier. You're almost like it's already you are eight, and they already tell you what you do wrong so seriously that that you, that you really get either 
um, a feeling of being successful or, or, or outcast. Uh, so, of course, everyone has to play piano, and that is not obligatory on a very good level, but everyone has to play piano. But we definitely, uh, in my area uh, of the, of the, of the, let's say, post-Soviet in, um, influences, we do treat or I, th I think even though the system changed and now when I'm a teacher, academic teacher, I still think that we we have that that um, heavy burden on our shoulders of or so shoulders of having being already having a prospect of, of a life of a musician while you are while you are seven. And I guess it's the same in Asia because they also treat it very seriously. We've got a lot of Asian students and, and I must say we sort of share the same uh, the, the same problems, uh, the same traumas, uh, mm. because they are differently shaped by by the culture. Uh, since we are more individualistic, and the Asians are a little bit more uh, within the community, but uh, I, I see some traces of the same traumas of being too early over responsible for our for our mm -hmm. lives. But otherwise, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be a musician. Yeah. If that really works, talking about career mm. and uh, and luck and job and work, but if that doesn't, then you then you have to probably get through some therapy, I guess. I don't know. I mean, that's yeah. what, how I see it. Oh, I I love that you brought that up. Sorry, I'm dominating the conversation, Adam. But the 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 interesting thing for the my son has a friend who practices piano two and a half hours a day, and uh, he's a, a Asian friend, and he's brilliant. But it is like it's such a it, it's such a commitment at this age of his life, right, to be playing so much. Um, and he's very, very talented. So I can totally identify with it. It's like, is it a, is it a blessing or is it not? Because uh, it, it does uh, require a lot of commitment and a lot of work and a lot of mandate from the parents that you're going to be successful in this, right? And and that's two and a half hours of playing every day, which is, is a lot for a 13-year-old child, right? So very interesting. <laughs> Sorry, Anna, do you want to ask a question? Uh, no, well, yes. <laughs> but I was just, uh, it's it's like I've, um, I started playing piano also when I was like three. Um, and, um, and one thing, I've always loved music, but one thing I always knew is that I was not going to really be a musician because I couldn't, I don't know if always, because when I was very early, I really liked it but I was not going to be able to study that many hours a day for my entire life. Um, and, and yeah, where, where do you draw the line and how, how do you accept that commitment when you're so young? I guess it's also how many choices you've got and how, how many opportunities your parents give you. Uh, I guess uh, that's why we are getting all these um, wonderful players from countries that have actually limited or used to have a limited or still have limited access to um, to whatever electronics, for example, or whatever kind of, I don't know, martial arts, whatever kind of hobby you can offer your child after school. Um, and apparently a lot of very good players, the ones who really devote themselves hours and hours every day are coming from troubled families, as if that would be mm. as an escape from from the conflicts that are actually, you know, next door, next room. It seems I'm teaching now 14 years and I take great interest into actually, and I get them on the last moment, you know, when they actually don't have parents anymore because they're 19 and they are still not adults in this sense that you earn money and then you are totally um, independent. So I, I meet these wonderful young people in moments that are that they still full of ideas and ideals and they have this dreams about becoming someone. And then during five years of studying this whole plan, and especially when you get to the end of, of the master uh, course, Somehow they see that life it's it's not exactly as in the cartoons and fairy tales now and and then they have to somehow rebuild the whole the whole structure they they have to mm. create new aims new dreams uh and the most important is not to not to lose the dream actually that's what I think it's like you just you just sort of navigate in a way that you still are having this wonderful childish 
um, will to be a princess or prince, but you just have to navigate and and, and get it through the narrow narrow um, space of uh, of conscientiousness. No, I mean you just need to get a slightly more realistic. Um, but I see a lot of people that were actually in childhood escaping from what whatsoever kind of traumas or feeling not really appreciated uh, within their peers or having whatever spectrum, being on spectrum of autism, ADHD or all of those um, difficult for others to bear um, social uh, awkwardness. And then they find a way to uh, to actually speak through music and uh, express their feelings and thoughts uh, through music. So it's not only how much you've got access to the newest technology or hobbies or whatever interests you can have, whatever yeah, things that might find fascinating, but it's also about our families and for people from Eastern Europe, um, I guess, you know, all these countries in our case, like, uh, like Bulgaria, Romania, uh, then I guess Asia is one of those uh, countries as well. It's when you don't really have so much, um, it's, it's when the economy of the country is not so great, uh, you just have less uh, to to wander around. You just get focused on something that actually can make your living better. And um, mm. playing instrument gives that feeling that if you work hard, you will achieve something. The only problem which I see is that it's underpaid vastly underpaid job mm -hmm. and if 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 only lawyers or doctors would study 17 years you know because in total it actually takes 17 years from starting seven in a primary music school and then you end up 24 with studying and at 17 years if if there was any other profession that takes 17 years to uh to study uh uh well then it's good when it works. I mean, I say if you have a career, it's fantastic. If you don't, it's it's well, it's an investment in being mm. culturally um, mature and being able to play some carols on a bank, uh, you know, Christmas or whatever. I don't know, you know, within within your yeah. colleagues and on the meeting of the lawyers or whatever. I mean, like you know, I'm like playing a violin and being a doctor or surgeon, whatever. I mean. Then you see, yeah. I mean, it's like it's a lot of hours that you invested, and if it doesn't work, if you are not social, if you don't have that thing, that little poetic element of you, your soul, then it becomes a little frustrating, and then you need to change the job. Mm. But otherwise, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful profession. And what was your first um, work or job in the industry after studying and? And growing up a little bit, what was your first paid musical job? So I was not after studying. I was very lucky. Uh, I was 20 when I started to get some interest in Baroque violin. The difference between violin and Baroque violin is mostly on the intellectual side. So uh, modern violin, it's what people usually see in uh, modern orchestras, this big symphonic orchestras that's full of, uh, full of violinists and instrumentalists. Uh, you basically need 30 of violins to play in um, in the symphonic orchestra. Uh, I don't know, I'm mean, just very shortly, it's like 15 of us playing the same part. So you practice and then you make uh, with all the 15s of your colleagues to make it sound as one, uh, something like more like uh, synchronic uh, swimming, for example. Uh, you are really not there to be the different one. Uh, while the whole, the whole, Education is about being unique, so it's a little bit, a little sacrifice. Um, then Baroque violin and Baroque basically historical and form performance practice. Uh, it's about um, how the music was performed and what was the, what were the values important back then when the music was composed. Uh, we talk about aesthetics, we talk about means of techniques, uh, the, the way they built instruments. Um, so when we go really back to Baroque, it means that whatever we use, it's way not so technologically advanced as it is now with the modern instruments. It causes a lot of 
difficulties to actually produce the notes, the sound to, to, to play. And then on top of that, which is the most important and which is fascinating, it's that you basically are ethically obliged to know what you play, how you play it, what people thought, what they, uh, what was their idea, uh, beneath actually writing it, what was the tradition, what was, uh, where the music was composed, for whom, and to come the closest to the way people um, actually uh, could have played that. Uh, well, in theater, it's like, for example, uh, what is now a little, gaining a little bit of, uh, I mean, it's it's becoming super fashionable, the origin pronunciation of, of Shakespeare, for example, or all these 16th uh, century theaters, just like really getting there to, pr to pronounce Shakespeare and the restoration uh, literature dramas in a way they were actually pr pronounced with uh, the right props, the right costumes, even even tailored with the costumes which, which were um, the way it was with the, even with the machines that were probably available at that time. So basically, that's a huge movement within the uh, cultural life, and I found that absolutely fascinating. In the age of twenty, so I started to play. And the moment I, I played my first first concert, it was a really little geek somewhere there, you know, in a little village. And uh, and I was lucky. Of course, everything goes about luck in life. I mean, of course, you need to work hard, but in the end, you just meet the right person, no? <laughs> uh, and that person, after this little, I don't know, it was like one hour concert playing almost side reading because it was so easy uh, and it was so so much fun and so much pleasure, uh, recommended me to the orchestra that I later on stayed for 15 years. Uh, and I was at that time 21. So from the moment of 21, I remember I got on Christmas Day, I got, uh, I went for one project. And then on Christmas Day, I got a list of projects that I'm invited for the whole next year. It was one of the most beautiful uh, Christmas presents I've received in my life. And from since that moment, from that moment on, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I work it the same way. I just get uh, invited to projects with different people, getting to know them. So I was 21 when it all started, uh, still having three, four years to study on modern violin, uh, making it possible to coexist. It's slightly different technique. You've got two different instruments. You also start thinking differently. So it didn't match exactly my teacher. And then you, of course, have to count on someone's understanding and, and openness. And that's what happens. Again, very lucky with people around, you know, just uh, helping not being a barricade, uh, not creating uh, troubles. Um, and then that allowed me to be 23 and get married because I thought like, Let's do it once you are financially sort of stabilized. You know, it's like all the things there are now. And I think from the perspective, we joined the European Union in 2009. But when I think about 20 years ago, the way of thinking is really like from a country of developing rather um, character than, than really being placed within the pal palette of plateau of countries that are already uh, having been well established economically. So 23, I got married, 25, I got Felix, uh, my first son, um, 28, I was, um, I had, uh, Gustav. So I was really, I'm really happy. And now the first vacation, uh, together with my husband without kids. So plan as far as, as far as it goes now, it goes exactly according to my dreams. So. <laughs> and somewhere in the middle, you started your own orchestra. Right. Right. And that just happened with luck as well. <laughs> and a lot it, of hard <laughs> A lot of work, a lot of hard work because it never it's never just I mean, if you build something, of course, uh you you need to work. I mean it's, no one is going to do to do the work. Uh but again, of course, it's it's about uh, being surrounded by wonderful people. Um this orchestra I started to play when I was twenty one. It's called Arte dei Suonatori in uh, Poland. It was one of the, was, and it still is, uh, led by um, a couple, Eva and Arek Golinscy. Um, 
what was wonderful about that concept, and I found that absolutely thrilling, uh, is that every month they invited someone from for a series of concerts. They invited someone from absolutely the top quality uh, stage of early music. Um, and that person was asked, and many times, and many times was encouraged, sorry, looking for the word, uh, encouraged to, um, to give their perspective in such a manner that we would be able to actually accommodate, domesticate most of the ideas within that very week. Um, but what I'm saying encouraged because people usually come, they give a bit, you know, like 10% or 15%, and then sort of they respect ensembles uh, characteristics, identity, and people don't want to impose things. And I mean, there are some that have no problem imposing things and even don't notice that, but there are the ones, especially when you come to, I don't know, some, some Dutch or British people or French, you know, the ones who just try to be gentle and they don't think, or they sort of don't think that they should colonize the whole world again. So, you know, they become a little bit gentle with, uh, with uh, imposing things. And so we actually all the time encourage them to say more, to, to, to actually point out um, more elements to be changed. Um, and there was three days or four days of rehearsals, five concerts to all together, nine days uh, every month. Uh, after nine years or 10 years of playing in this orchestra, every month someone different, every month someone with completely different idea. And I found that, uh, I mean, it was a huge step in education, but also in being flexible after this. You get so many ideas from month to month, you change how people think. Um, and uh, I, I remember, I still have some, I still have some friends that 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 kept uh, correspondence with me, you know, just like writing emails, just asking questions or advising, and uh, that that's wonderful. I mean, the, the the emotional ties you you make during these nine days. So that was the first thing. I mean, like after ten years of playing every month, ten ten projects per year with uh, some distinct, very well-established musicians, uh, you get a palette of possibilities. And there is one moment you need to choose who you want to be because there is this palette and then you need to have your own identity. But these, all these people started to inviting others. So that's how it works. Of course, again, people, you know, just whoever you meet, you need to be lucky because they they take you somewhere. And, uh, and, and I've... I'm quite lucky to, to, to work a lot in France, uh, which is for our early music, I think the most refined and the most successful um, um, market, early music market, let's say. It's the, really the most successful place. A lot of ensembles, a lot of wonderful production. Um, yeah, I think in music, in, in arts, basic Paris still keeps its place as it used to be in 19th century. Um, it's not the place for everything, but in art, in visual arts, in dancing, in music, it still keeps the place of being the, the, the main, the, the leading role in Europe. Um, and from there, I just learned... Also, the the way you know they do, they they actually creating stars. You know what they do? They choose one person, and they are actually creating a star with all means, television interviews, and someone can be twenty two, and they they basically um, find a person that is musically, intellectually, poetically appealing, but also physically. That's that's one of those things. Doesn't have to be beautiful. It has to be specific. It has to be have something you now to like for the eye of the camera, for the eye of the audience. And they mm -hmm. basically make that person to be a star. Uh, for ten years I had opportunity to to actually observe how they how they make it. It's not exactly possible to 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 uh to bring it to another part of the world because not everyone has is so much uh, concerned about the 
art as French art, but it is possible in certain way to to start an orchestra and avoid many mistakes of beginners once you once you have observed that in another culture. So in twelve two thousand twelve, uh, being surrounded by by very good players and uh, nice colleagues of mine, we decided to to actually form an orchestra. Um, yeah, and since then it's 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 working. It's working. It's still being very much inspired by what my colleagues in other countries are doing because it seems like they are doing it early earlier enough to notice where are the difficulties and how to avoid the troubles and what what direction to go. The one that already works, so you don't waste time for for fixing your own, uh, mending your own big mistakes. Is that when you stepped into being a conductor? Like, what was that transition from you know playing to conducting? But there's always a dream to do something bigger, isn't it? And it's like you cannot you cannot <laughs> help it. You cannot help it. And also, uh, making bigger things is also also means that you that you give more work to people. So uh, mm-hmm. and and especially on a certain level, you give work that also give a feeling feeling of of dignity. If there is a prestige, and it's actually more about that. That's what is actually now for me uh, super motivating. Uh, it's just to give this feeling of of uh, of dignity as a musician, uh, because in some of the countries we forgot about that. You know, like someone plays a recorder and they hear all the time and professionally, and they practice hours and hours and they play amazing things, but they always hear that what they do for a living. Uh, yeah, yeah, I play a recorder. Yes, but what do you do for a living? I, you know, my daughter also plays a recorder. It's you know, it's there is sometimes people don't really treat musicians. They don't even consider musicians to 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 do to have to have a that that is actually the the, the main occupation. That's that's how you should earn your money, no? Uh, it's I mean you would be surprised how many times we hear it. I mean it's like yeah yeah I also, <laughs> I also always wanted to play violin and my daughter plays the piano, and and, and you could and you see that there is no understanding of how much of intellectual processing. Now, thought processing must go if you want to do it professionally. And then in concept, and it, it touches music, touches, uh, especially in opera, in theater, in musical theater, it touches that what the Greeks were calling catharsis. So you basically create a performance that starts way, way before before you start the first note and ends really sometimes even two years after where people actually get to certain conclusions being based on the quality of the performance, being, you know, just being driven by some special sounds, some special meanings of the words, the way people sang something, the way the way that the, the director, the stage director has actually made it um, and, and picture it. Uh, so it is an amazing part of our life, sometimes demeaned by uh, by someone who has a daughter who plays also a recorder. Um, so I think that what is, uh, I mean, it's a lovely, it's, it's, it's absolutely charming discussions, you know, and a lovely uh, uh, way of connecting with people to talk about music. But it can be super professional on, on a super high level intellectually and aesthetically. And one of those, it's opera. One of those moments where you actually can really fully understand and have an impact on someone else's and your own life. It's to change it. It's opera. One would say the moment you go to the theater to see a drama and afterwards, after you've seen it, you've never the same person anymore. And that, that's what I think it's the beauty of theater. You're never the same. Because you've got a bunch of new ideas, reflections, or really uh, experiences uh, changing factors that are changing your life. And that was the moment uh, I thought that opera would be great to make. Uh, and for the opera, you need to conduct. It's a lot of people. It's, it's stage and the pits to organize. It's just a matter of organizing people. 
conducting is actually about being responsible for all the thing and thinking and spending time to try to comprehend um, it the most clearly and most consistent way. So people feel rather led than being just organized, just organized, you know, it's just like logistics. You, you, you get trams and trains and buses in the town organized, but but um, opera and uh, conducting is about leading and comprehending something very complex and it's fascinating. So that was the moment. I think we made the first opera around 2017 and we met a wonderful singer, Max Emanuel Cencic, who it happened that he also has his own agency. And now that's a wonderful thing about getting older, you know, and that people actually get some important positions uh, and they and they get these positions because they are uh, competent and with max we are doing next year two productions uh and again it's about you know giving this feeling of doing something bigger and uh, creating something new so that that was that what was the element of changing into conducting and now a note from our sponsor the Theatre Art Life podcast is proud to be sponsored by ClearCom. ClearCom is the leader in voice communications for theatre and the performing arts. Call your cues with the simplicity and elegance of ClearCom Intercom Solutions. You can find them at C-L-E-A-R-C-O-M dot com. Go check them out. That's kind of fascinating the way you just explain your transition and how how everything unfolded. And it's also I feel like a lot of passion, which I guess you need after so many years to keep doing it and not change your job and, and keep being in love with music. Um, but also, I feel like musicians, I want to say, I don't know if more so than others, I don't know, circus artists also do this, but it really becomes part of your yourself. Like your identity is completely tied to your profession and to see that evolve as, as you evolve in life as well is very interesting and, and how you approach music from different perspectives, I guess. Are the circus artists doing it since they are very small? Is it, yeah. is it like? I think that's why. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be a successful a circus artist, you start when you're what, three, four, five, wow. you know, and they often grow up as families and, and that sort of thing. And so it is inextricably tied to their identity. And I think it's the same with professional musicians. You, you, you have to start early to have all of that in your DNA, right? And like you mentioned before, you've got to master it by thousands and thousands of hours of practice. And it's the same for circus artists. And that's fascinating because then if you go through your youth and then your teen years, and that's a big part of it, then how do you, how are you anything else, right? <laughs> like you can't extract yourself from that, that when it's been your life. It's really interesting. I think that's why when some people like, fortunately for a lot of musicians, you can do that for a very, very long time. But the arc of a performer finishes at a period of time and then that transition can be very difficult if they haven't prepared themselves psychologically for it, right? Like at some point you have to retire from circus arts, whereas with musicians you can tend to play well into however late you can, right? Almost a retirement age, you could hypothetically keep playing, um, but that's not the same for circus artists. It was a very interesting parallel that you just made then, but yeah. <laughs> Well, with music, I guess it's a little bit more like with literature, with like with drama. Um, we do touch a beauty that is impossible to explain. We do, we do. Yeah. It's the same with the. Uh, uh, it's also aesthetically speaking, that's beauty, and also there is a concept which is on a genius level with some of the composers, and it's the same for for writers. Um, yeah. So it always makes you a little modest, but also there is a space for people who are very narcissistic because if they can comprehend that genius level, 
uh, gives a feeling of being equally genius. Uh, but that's true. There are people that are equally genius. I mean, there is this amazing conductor, Klaus Mekele. He's now, I think, I think he's 28. He was 26 when he became a conductor, chief conductor of uh, Paris Philharmonie, which is, you know, one of the most, the, the best playing orchestras in the world. And they made 26 years old boy, basically, uh, their chief director, artistic director. And uh, he's definitely, he is definitely one of these living geniuses. I mean, just you meet him <clears> and <throat> you see how he works and then how many things he can actually comprehend. And so many things are easy for him that are not so easy and not easy to comprehend for 60 years old. Um, and that that is wonderful, which I don't know. I don't know much about circus, or because circus somehow is very close to sport in certain way, uh, uh, unless there are this amazing dancing, for example. It's also this one of this because of the choreography uh, that can be on a genius side. Oh well, I mean. It's all, after all, about people. I mean, you touch something which is which is beauty and intellectually intellectually demanding. Uh, but again, I would say the Darwin Darwin uh, natural selection is here. I mean, of course, it can be appealing intellectually as far as you can uh, comprehend that. Uh, uh, so. It's it's all about this about natural selection. I mean, people are just they they go in groups, no? The ones who actually comprehend yeah. things and the ones who 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 are just happy playing <laughs> melodies and carols, no? And are you know? Yeah. So so that's what it is. I mean, you make somehow it's what fascinates me. I, I thought about that a few days ago. It's you cannot really explain how people match together in groups, uh, the 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 more successful groups, you know. Uh, because you can't really put a finger right on it. You, 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 it's just almost like people just get together because they understand the depth of the of the task uh, mm. in the same way, or at least on the same level, uh, if not in the same way. Um, all this natural selection, it goes so without any word spoken. You just you just get a call and then you cannot express and actually explain why. It's just you just know that you want to play with that person. And although the colleague plays equally well, you, you for some reason, for somehow you just call that one, not the other one. Um, you're really not able to. I mean, we can all put something in words, but in the end there is this human relationship magic uh, that you connect more there's someone that you know that you are safer and your your communication mm. on the stage is going to be more fulfilling as well for for us artists and for the audience because that's another part of the whole show you know it's the audience um that the message is going to be just what be, just better formed uh and more distinctive way in on a on a more satisfying level, and we'll all not only get you know, because you dress nicely. That's one thing. So there is already part of the public that goes like, "Whoa, she looks so great," or "He looks so handsome," or whatever. Um, but there is this part that that uh, reacts on music because there are nice melodies, no, and a lot of rhythm. Let's let's dance a little bit, like you know, we've got the Bolivia Orchestra or something. You know, they've got a lot of rhythm. It's fantastic. And then you've got people who just play lovely melodies. Um, in Europe, that's that's the Italian way, you know. They they, they play melodies. They always phrase. They it's always like it's mm -hmm. like they come <laughs> from the beginning till the end, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And then you act on it. But there are some people and some ensembles, um, some groups that uh, that deliver these intellectual qualities of of what I said before, catharsis. No, that you that you not the same person and I, I remember although he's not so uh i mean media hasn't been very graceful to him but john elliott gardiner it's a it's amazing conductor uh, from uk um I, I think something of a minor of minor 
there was an incident that he didn't, who couldn't stand one singer, who was, uh, as I know it from exactly that pro- that that production, he was uh, irritating everyone around and being very capricious. But uh, John Elliot Gardiner couldn't stand it in one of the last concerts. He just slapped his face. Uh, and that's been like a huge violent episode. And I do <laughs> agree that we shouldn't do it, definitely. But apparently from the inner circle of John Elliot Gardiner, this this uh, production was very intense and tense because of exactly this singer. Uh, but media are not talking about this absolutely unacceptable behavior for three weeks that this singer offered all the all the people around. They are only uh, about John Elliot Gardiner. Um, uh, behaving a little, uh, I mean, the lack of gentlemanship a little bit there. But uh, but he is one of those who offers feeling of actually attending something not only superb in quality but something sacred. Whatever yeah. music it is, doesn't matter if it's religious or not. It's just sacred. It's it's on the level of of a big mystery that people are attending. And what happens is that people, when he goes on the stage, people are clapping and applauding for the last concert they've attended with him. So last time I was in Leipzig on a festival and people were clapping 10 minutes before he even started the concert. And <laughs> and I find that incredible and very moving. Wow. Very moving. I mean, people just stand up because he came on the stage. And clapping ten minutes for all of the good he, he's done to music, uh, and I think that's beautiful. That's that's amazing part of of being around these people. Even seeing that, it's, mm. it's like how many jobs you've got, how many professions you actually get to get a ten minutes applause for the last I don't know bridge that you that you built or. You know, like not many. <laughs> not many, no. I I can't imagine. I mean, it's like you know, it's like. Nah, that's uh, total total another level for sure. <laughs> so, what would you say is your most favorite thing about the your job or the industry? So, I find fascinating uh, in the industry. I find fascinating how you can improve level of some ensembles, not only on the musical level, uh, on on the musical uh, level. But also, also in how to make them being visible for the media and the audience and being uh, relatively more famous. You know, it takes time to be really famous, uh, and some people can do it faster or slower. But uh, but how to? That, that's almost like a chess playing. You're just sitting there looking at all the options that are around on the table and uh, asking questions why are they not successful enough or why if they are such a good players they are not used in a way that it's actually that are profiting from um that particular combination of characters um and it's the same for ensembles uh i found that sometimes i'm having i have a look on for example american early music scene uh and it's fascinating because it's 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 such a huge country. It's I don't know, three hundred fifty million people in America, something like this. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the that. and the whole industry and and the and the film industry it's in great condition. No, I mean it's like you know everyone is watching Oscars, but no one speaks about uh, music in America. You know, it's it's like how is that possible? I mean, early music, no one, and we've got this movement last forty or fifty years. And we've got this, I mean, it's absolutely pulsating uh, place, you know, on the musical map of ensembles. It's just, we've got this little eruptions here and there. It's like a geysers, you know, it's like, it's just there, you know, France, England, but it's every little geyser, every ensemble. And then it's this plateau of America and they're like, I don't know, five, six ensembles. And basically we don't know about them. I mean, there is like two of them from the whole continent, maybe three that we hear about. And um, that's uh, including Canada. Uh, So that's fascinating, you know. It's like, I'm thinking like, I mean, what is the problem? I would love to check, you know, that I would love to just go there and and just being, you know, like forced to (laughs) actually take, take, 
serious interest in why is it like what doesn't work and how it can be fixed from the also economic point of view, organization point of view. Like, I mean, that this every state has a television. I mean, like there are radios. I mean, like, you know, this amazing country, you think like it's their access, having access to everything, the newest technology and everything. And still this early music, which is one of the, for me, one of the most uh, vital forms of of uh, music gatherings, it's not working there. And I would love to, I mean, like I'm, I have, I just love, you know, this, it's so fascinating just to get to know why it doesn't work and actually make one example of how it can work if you if you think it thorough thoroughly with all the consequences and just finding where is the barricade, where is the blockage no of 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 the mm. process. So that's what I find fascinating in this in this uh, industry. And in music in generally building an ensemble it's it's almost like anticipating it's like being therapist who anticipates the troubles of communication between people um mm. because people are going to feel uneasy to step on someone else's uh, weaknesses and 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 usually ensembles have a tendencies of getting rather less intellectually active than more intellectually active unless you are motivating people to work uh, of, or inspire them. Um, so musically speaking, it works exactly the same way. I mean, people are, what I've noticed, musicians are, and we are all, I think, very happy if we find ourselves doing our job extremely well. Uh, and not everyone can really keep the level. But though, if someone actually made us to be very good in what we do, being a part of something of ex exquisite quality, we do grow this feeling of gratitude in our hearts for that person that brought us on that level. So this leadership is about avoiding conflicts which are unnecessary because not all of the conflicts are unnecessary but the ones which are unnecessary and actually stopping the the flow and the second thing is to to make it this way that people are actually grateful to to each to each other too for to i mean they they have this gratitude feeling towards each other uh, for what the person next to me is doing as well as I'm doing. You know, it's like when I hear that someone can play fantastic, it's not only that that person plays fantastic, the person plays fantastic because it's surrounded by another pe person who is supporting and giving space for that and giving this calm ac feeling full of acceptance. This field somehow, this space of love that you've got around you is accepting that some things might go wrong but basically you are good enough being well before selected by what i already said the darwin idea of natural selection but <laughs> if you select people really well so they have they find it their needs are corresponding with someone else's needs um then you then you give a feeling of fulfillment. And some are there creating such a group of people that feel fulfilled intellectually and artistically. Um, it's a wonderful, I find still, I still find it a wonderful mission. Mm. That's what I find. We are making people, there is, there is an amazing, the, the, the facial expressions of people that are happy artistically you cannot Nothing describe better. that you cannot mm. you cannot buy it in a shop you know they don't sell it <laughs> you, you can't you cannot buy it <laughs> i absolutely love your passion it's just ah it's beautiful thank you 
stay. I bet it comes from people around that because it's that this feeling, you know, because you see these people there and you also feel like that's exactly what I want. Maybe sometimes it's not perfect or but in all this materialistic world, you know, that it matters how many cars you've got and how big house you have and uh and then you deliver something. I mean, one of those things is like health or love, you know, or friendship. You, you you don't buy it, no? But this thing about fulfilling someone's needs, even the ones that people don't know that they have, that is the thing about the leader, you know? You deliver, you, you fulfill needs that they are not aware of. And then mm. they come even five years later and they are just grateful because they see they grow. And I have that experience, of course, with musicians that I've been lucky to play with. So um, still I'll go somewhere. So like, oh, yeah, now I understand what he meant this 20 years ago. And then you call mm -hmm. someone saying, yeah, thank you for that, because now I understood that. Uh, I have a mentor, uh, Andras Steyer, he's a pianist. He's 70 something. Uh, and uh, there are many times I've. I didn't call him so many times, but I should have. <laughs> uh, just to, I mean, just to just to thank him for these few words that were absolutely not. I didn't comprehend at that time, but now yes. And I think that's the role of the leader, that you, that you settle conditions for. For reflections, yes. For reflections bigger than people are at this very moment. So that's what fascinates. And music absolutely allows that because it's one of so, it's so voluminous. It gives so many options and it's so on a genius level, intellectually and aesthetically, that, that you can operate on a very modest level, but you can also have in the same group, you can have people that are just geniuses. Mm. And if you could change one thing about the industry or your job, what would that be? Well, it's connected with finances, of course, with, with economic situation of the art and education. People who... The, the problem is in, not, in developing country is that people who usually get uh, close to money, they are more trade connected. Um, and trade or trade orientate and people who do trade, they are, it takes generations to understand that you need art once you have money. Uh, so the old countries with old, uh, aristocracy or people who already have a lot of money for a long time, they come to conclusion that they need art. But in all of those developing countries, you've got musicians, you've got artists of different sorts. And you've got people who have money, but these people who have money usually don't feel any need for art because it's too early in the history of that country. Um, and that is, unless it's something fashionable, you know, like buying a Picasso, sure. Uh, then people spend money on it. Uh, but already sculptures, you know, no one knows sculptures unless it's Rodin or something, but you cannot buy a Rodin because it's in the, you know, in a museum. So yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you know what I mean? I mean, like, yeah. you can go painting and then, mm -hmm. now you can buy a nice instrument, but if you don't play on it, and then I would, I would love that to be changed. Um, so, but it has, to go together with education and actually being a witness of something, you know, it's like you remember that you had that feeling and nothing else is going to give it to you except going to the theater. No, but you have to go to the theater when you're five and seven and ten. That must be parents who take you. But usually people who in these developing countries, people who come to money suddenly, nouveau riche kind of, no? Uh, mm -hmm. They come, they 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 come there because of the of the trade because of finding this uh, niche in business making it using money producing the, you know the facial masks during uh, during covid you know suddenly you get yeah. super 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 wealthy uh but from producing masks facial masks you know 
you don't really probably go to the concert. No, you're busy with probably you go to the to the shop with uh, I don't know with pencils and rather and, and and books or whatever. Not to the concert. So that is the thing because I I think at the same time in the same country the ones who would probably make the country to exist and cons- would construct the country much quicker and actually make it attractive for tourism are actually artists because nothing else it's bringing country to be famous the way art is doing it no matter if it's architecture or if it's music dance uh, theater already theater it's a little bit risky because it's it's with words and this language um language links so you know it's it's not really a touristic thing to do and that's it's a it's a it's um anglo anglo uh, speaking zone mm-hmm. but i think for countries that are really developing or even not starting to be developing uh, art would make a difference and we would they would all profit in tourism from having artists active but then artists are really on the last position of payment i mean it's like we consider them useless uh you know. um while uh, all these thousands and million tourists shows that that, that they are not that people still going to to Italy, no? Uh, mm. And there are movies about Italy going to Italy. It seems like in America going to Paris, it's like the biggest dream on earth, no? I mean, it's like you finally feel the the citizen of the world, you know, of the planet. If we went to Paris, no, there is nothing else except for art in Paris. Mm. There is nothing else. It's just art, pure art. Or the museums, you just don't do anything else. You just go to museums. But I have, it seems like you know people are. It's an incredible amount of people money going flowing together with tourism um and developing countries artists are actually on the worst position teachers and artists i think are the worst paid uh professions in countries that are not there yet so i think that would change that poland is poland is not it's already not on such a bad um position but uh, we still feel the lack of appreciation for our job i think the selection also needs to be there i don't know how to select art you know because it's such a vague thing you know what is you know if that drawing is actually an art or is just a childish yeah what is good is so subjective right so that's the difficult thing when people are engaging in it what what is good and what's great for the what represents the culture and the country right (laughs) exactly that's great well martina thank you so much for uh, spending uh an hour with us on the theater out life podcast we've been so joyful to hear about your career and your passion and your work and we might have to get back you back again at some point to talk about leadership and stuff you're a fascinating person to talk to so thank you so much thank you very much thank you very much see you next time Thank you. Bye. Theater at Life is a global media site for entertainment. Memberships start at only 38 US dollars per year. You can have unlimited access to our daily published articles, including entertainment news and the writings of active industry professionals, ensuring that you are always up to date on the global happenings in the world of entertainment. Become a part of the international entertainment community and join us now at www.theaterartlife.com